Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we again take up our study in Judges chapter 14, and look then to progress into Judges 15, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction, so that we may more clearly understand the symbols that are being presented before us, and that which we need to understand for this time in which we live. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we begin this new week, as we begin this set of studies, we have great need of you. Help us to understand that which is presented before us. Direct us, please, so that we may clearly understand that which is written within your word. As we look upon this example and we consider the symbols that are presented, may your spirit guide us. Help us so that we may more clearly understand how these symbols relate to what we're going through now. May your angels attend us. Help us so that our conversations that we have in these studies may be edifying for those that will watch these studies later. Direct us, please, Father. We need you so that our characters are not being revealed, so that your character becomes part of us. Help us so that as we study, that iron may sharpen iron, that we may be more prepared to give a message to this world before the close of its probation. For this, Father, we thank you. In this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. We were dealing with Samson's marriage just last week, and we were coming to the very end of this chapter. So as we came to this, we know that Samson's wife has wept sore before him because Samson has not trusted her with the meaning of the riddle. And the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said unto them, if ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. So the riddle of Samson is discovered. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he went down to Ascalon. And he slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. So in this situation, <clears throat> Samson now is turning his back upon his new wife. And he's turning his back upon those of Timnah, where she lived. What symbols are we seeing here? When you turn your back upon a church, as you turn your back upon a wife, are you not rejecting what 
the manner in, in, in which they are approaching things? Would you be rejecting their message? Now, Samson has taken this, he's, he's taken the shirts and the garments of 30 that he's now destroyed. What is symbolic by this? Where he goes to Ascalon, he goes to another city and he slays 30 men of Ascalon. Okay, so. So we have some problems here that we have to solve um, that I don't know if we, because we haven't decided on some things, but so Samson, it, so this, um, this wife, of course, would represent um, the false method of study. It's the strange wives, right? That's how we've understood it. Right. And, and there is this riddle, and we're saying that this riddle relates to um, a test in this movement present. Right? It would look that way. Okay. Um, and there's going to be this a, a betrayal that happens with this woman, that's his wife. And and then when this betrayal occurs, he he's angry and he goes to his father's house. So he turns his back on this woman, on this strange wife. So in this movement, it would have to represent um, something still future regarding what's going to happen with this riddle. If, if we're applying this correctly. And the 30, what does the 30 represent? How have we understood the 30 in this story and in other stories in Judges? Well, the 30 is a fractal of, of uh, Gideon's 300. Yeah, but we, we've applied it to the 30 years. Okay. Right. So that, that it and, was also the age in which, uh, sorry, Theodore, it was also the age in which a man be could become a full fledged priest at 30. Right. Which is why we apply it to this movement. Right. That's where we originally got the 30. So. So would this be uh, the movement then becoming mature? I don't, I don't know that I see it that way. Okay. I mean, at this, at this point, going to another city and slaying 30, I don't know that I would see it as the movement becoming mature at that point. Well, remember, Samson is representing this movement ironically. He's representing the movement as a type, right? Yeah, but but in in sort of the negative sense of things, he's not he's not a good example. He's a bad example. Correct. But it illustrates this movement, and so the slaying of the thirty would would have to rep represent something to deal with the movement and the symbol we've used for the movement is the 30 so that the number of men can represent years well in the, in this situation samson representing the movement but not in a good way um as we would as we would look further Eli representing the church, but not in a good way. Mm -hmm. And then Samuel representing the movement, but in a good way. Yeah. So 
So, Samson representing the movement, but not in a good way, goes down to Ascalon, slays 30, takes their apparel, and gives this to those that expand expound upon the of, of the riddle. Yeah, and Ascalon is a weighing place. Okay. So this is a <coughs> what we have for the 2520 that were weighed in the balances and found wanting. So it, it's kind of a scale then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it comes from the word shackle. So, ask Gilon, which means to weigh. So he goes from Timna to Askelon. Now, it's kind of interesting because Timna is a bit, according to the, the little maps that I had looked at, Timna would have been a bit northwest of Ascalon. Okay. I'll see if I've got those available. Yeah. And then the question was, what do the garments represent? Well, specifically, a change of garments. Um, Because the word there means a change, alter, alter, alternation. So it is what. So it doesn't really have the word garments there. It has the word change. Okay. Who does the them represent? Uh, the them? The ones that uh, did the riddle. Yeah, the 30 men who are slain um, are the ones that we're talking about here. Uh, so then he gives them to the ones who had um, uh, expounded the riddle. So there's there's the 30 men who expounded the riddle, and then there's the 30 men that he's going to kill. He's going to take their garments and give them to the 30 men that expounded the riddle. So is, is that what you're asking about, but them that he kills? The, the ones that solved the riddle. Yeah, okay. And garments represent what are? Well, change of character. Yeah, so when we have this 30 and we have this doubling, we have a, a structural chiasm that begins with 777 days. And that 777 days begins and ends with the periods of 30 years, right? So we have uh, November 9th, which uh, 1989 to 2019 is 30 years, and then we have December 25th, 20, uh, 1991 and 2021, another period of 30 years. And so this would have to represent these two periods of 30 years, in my understanding. So the question is, how is the 777 justified? Um, so when we started looking at this, this whole story in the beginning, the story of Samson, um, right here, 
So um, there was a whole bunch of symbols that were used. There was the 40 years and there was the 20 years of Samson. And um, we had addressed those periods of time. So they're going to begin in 1989. So that's going to be uh, where we would start. Um, and there was uh, there was some other symbols as well. Um, trying to remember. Uh, let me see here. Well, there's the seven day feast for one. So how would the seven days feast relate to the 777 structure? So Ron's asking this question. That was the seven seven. There's a doubling with the 30 men and there's the 777. Again, this is, um, to me, rather sort of not really answering your question, but going to this year 30 symbol and then yeah. a seven. Yeah. You have the, the, priest, the priests and then they're going to be um, sort of seven days consecration. Yeah. You have, yeah. You have the 30, 30, 30th year in Ezekiel and then the seven days where he's taken away and sits before the elders. and. And Tel Aviv. Yep. Uh, and then you have 30 years Christ and then followed by the week. Seven years there. So um, to me, uh, there seems to be a, you could maybe see, or, uh, see a connection with them structures. Mm -hmm. This is Samuel Samson. Yeah, that's that's the way that I would look at it. Do you have, because we've talked about this before. The 30 years and the seven days consecration of the priests, the 30, 30 years and then the seven days. So that seven days would have to relate to uh, that period of time related to the 777 days. Although in this year case, these 30, this is coming at the end of the seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With Ezekiel, with Ezekiel, you maybe have the 31st all by the 7th, so it's a sort of a different dynamic well, to it. Yeah, but we have the 30 and the 7 connected. So um, just another thought. Um, mm -hmm. We had Jacob being 77 years old when he has them seven years, and then you have that seven day, that week, where he marries Leah, and mm -hmm. then another seven years. So again, maybe you can sort of see like a seven, seven, seven there. I know I know when uh, Jacob, when he marries, he's like 84. So, but it's, he's sort of in the middle with two periods of sevens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for but that. When he when he marries at eighty four, that's also seven times twelve. Yeah. Seven times twelve. Yep. And then yeah. and then seven years and then and then seven years he's going to have twelve children, eleven boys and one girl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In that in that seven years, yes. Yeah. So there are two periods of sevens together. Yeah, I, this is something we're, we're going to have to look at in a bit more detail again. So Dwight, you want to just go to your map since it's there? Well, 
is the map up? Yeah, it's up. Okay. So we have Timna here just below Ekron. Now, Timna is where he gets married. He had the city of Ekron not far, but he goes down to Ascalon. And that looks to be a bit of a distance. Unless this map is, is completely incorrect. Well, I mean, it's not a very big area you're looking at, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a fair walk. So, so he gets, his riddle is discovered before sundown. He walks down to Ascalon, slays 30, returns to Timna, gives the garments to those that return to him the riddle. And then he turns his back on his bride and returns to his father's house. So it becomes, it becomes kind of interesting that all of this occurs symbolically. Now, so his anger was kindled and he went up to his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companion who he had used as his friend. Okay, so so uh, just dealing with the distance, it's 33.9 kilometers by okay. road from uh, Ekron to Ashkelon. All right. Um, and then uh, this change of raiment, did we address that, what that symbolizes? Well, in a good way, we would be saying a change of character. Right. But in this situation, is this being represented in a good way? Well, it's not being represented in a good way. We, we recognize <clears throat> that this whole story is not, but because it's ironic, it still represents a change of character in a positive way. That is, we have to look at all of these things in the story of Samson as illustrating God's work in a reform line. So even though the story is negative, it's ultimately positive. And so the 30 men must represent a change of character that happens with, within the movement. All right. So then we have the verse. But Samson's wife was given to his companion, whom he had used as his friend. Now, the translators would look at it in this way. Judges 15, 2, which comes up next. And her father said, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. So, again, you have an ironic representation of Jacob with Leah and Raquel. The father-in-law has given the older daughter to the companion. And now here, looking at John 3.29, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoice, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. So 
the friend of the bridegroom, as we would say in our vernacular, the best man, is the one that to whom the bride is given. Now, Mrs. White was kind of clear about some of these, these items. The divine promise to Manoah was in due time fulfilled with the birth of a son, upon whom the name of Samson was bestowed. By the command of the angel, no razor was to come upon the child's head, he being consecrated to God as a Nazarite from his birth. As the boy grew up, it became evident that he possessed extraordinary physical strength. This was not, however, as Samson and his parents well knew, dependent upon his well-knit sinews, but upon his condition as a Nazarite, <clears throat> of which his unshorn hair was a symbol. Had Samson faithfully obeyed the divine command as his parents had done, his would have been a nobler and happier destiny but he became corrupted by association with idolaters. The inheritance of the tribe of Dan to which Manoah's family belonged was adjacent to the country of the Philistines. Indeed, the little town of Zorah, which was Samson's early home, was in close proximity to the dwelling places of this alien race. And in his youth, he came to mingle with them on friendly terms. Thus intimacies sprung up whose evil influences darkened his whole life. A young woman dwelling in the Philistine town of Timnah so engaged Samson's affections that he determined to make her his wife. In those days, marriages were arranged by the parents. Hence, Samson requested his father and mother to secure for him his, this daughter of the Philistines. Manoah and his wife sought to dissuade the young man from his purpose. They warned him of the danger of forming an alliance with idolaters and besought him to seek a wife among his own people. But arguments and entreaties were alike in vain. His only answer was, she pleaseth me well. Seeing his determination, the parents decided that the Lord might design thus to accomplish his purposes Hence, they yielded to Samson's wishes, and the marriage was consummated. <clears throat> Thus, at the time, above all others, when he should have maintained entire consecration to the will of God, just as he was entering upon this stage of manhood, the period when he must execute his divine mission, at this critical point in his life's history, Samson yielded to the tempter and by an unwise marriage placed himself in alliance with the enemies of God. <coughs> this, this portion is in agreement with what Stephen had presented in tabled history that very likely we're dealing with Samson being somewhere in his late teens, possibly as late as 20 years old, where he is choosing by this unwise marriage to come in Congress with the Philistines. This important step was not carefully considered. Samson did not ask himself whether he could better glorify God when united with the object of his fancy, or whether he was placing himself in a position where he could not fulfill the purpose to be accomplished by his life. To all who seek first to honor him, God has promised wisdom, but there is no promise to those who desire only to please themselves. The Lord has in his word plainly instructed his people not to unite themselves with those who have not his love and fear before them. Such companions will seldom be satisfied with the love and respect which are justly theirs. They will constantly seek to gain from the God-fearing wife or husband some favor which shall involve a disregard of the divine requirements. 
to a godly man and to the church with which he is connected. A worldly wife or a worldly friend is as a spy in the camp who will watch every opportunity to betray the servant of Christ and to expose him to the enemy's attacks. <clears throat> I take this admonition very personally because I have lived through this. So this is something that in this story with Samson, something that I can relate to very directly. Satan is constantly seeking to strengthen his power over the people of God by inducing them to enter into alliance with the hosts of darkness. And to accomplish this, he endeavors to arouse unsanctified passions in the heart, which is naturally prone to evil. It is not safe for Christians to imitate the example of the ungodly or to yield to their influence. The wisest counsels of the wicked are not to be relied upon. If accepted, they may bring trouble and sorrow unto the child of God. The Lord would not have his people take ungodly persons into their confidence. The Apostle Paul exhorts us to have no fellowship with the unfaithful, the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. <clears throat> For what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Samson made a choice. It was a very poor choice. The church made a very poor choice in rejecting the 2520 and in continuing with the situations that occurred with Prescott, with Cottrell, with Desmond Ford, with all of the situations that we see from 1863 to 1888, to 1901, 1919, and into 1957. An interesting thing about this, because um, in researching some of this history uh, with, um, you know, Froome and others, so we, we had talked about Froome's book, uh, The Coming of the Comforter, his lectures in 1928. Um, and we also had uh, with uh, Prescott, he had the, the magazine called The Protestant. Right. And, and what they were trying to do was to align themselves with the evangelicals quite early on. They basically, because of their choices, they wanted to have this acceptance. They wanted to be seen as peers instead of as a cult. Um, that's really where this whole issue began. And, and when you read Froome and when you read a lot of this material, on the surface, it actually seems very conservative Adventist. And, and the interesting thing about it is that many conservative Adventists who, who believe in the spirit of prophecy do not notice the problems with that material that was written at that time. It, the... The influence is subtle, but it's, it's the accept, acceptance of a premise that if followed to its logical conclusion leads away from Adventism. And what, what is that premise? What I understand about Froome is that this his entire premise is a false righteousness by faith. Yeah, and, and, and it's a false rightness, righteousness by faith based upon man's perception. That is, man believes that he can see the things of God without, without it, the natural man. The natural man is the problem. And even though they give lip service to, you know, our sinful nature and so forth, 
They actually believe that the natural man, the mind of man, can understand the things of God in and of himself. But we don't recognize how far we have fallen. We trust in man, and we trust in man's words and man's perceptions, in our own impressions, our own feelings. And, and that's totally contrary to Miller's rules. The basic premise is that man is, that Miller has, is that we are sinful and we need God's direct illumination in order to understand the scriptures. And that the scriptures give that illumination because they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. But man criticizes God's word, and that's where we went astray. Um, when I was nine years old, um, my Sunday school teacher, who had been, uh, she had been an alcoholic, and um, she was a very nice old lady. But she, she warned us, our class, and I, I may be the only one that picked up on what she was saying, but she was talking about um, uh, uh, the errors that had come into the church. At that time, you know, United Church of Canada is like the Methodists. And she said that there are people who are going to hold themselves above the Bible, but the Bible is the only thing that can guide us. And, and I always remembered that as I went through, you know, as I grew up. Um, but what she was saying is she was talking basically about the modern scholarship. And that's what Adventism bought into. So that, um, that's really a concord of trying to mix Christ and Belial. Dealing, dealing with Froome was not something that I was ever able to do. I had friends that gave me the coming of the comforter with the greatest of recommendations, how clear my understanding would be after I read this. But this was one of those books that when it was given to me, there was a voice that continued to tell me not to read it, just as a friend had given me a copy of Walter Ray's book, The White Line. Now, there are a lot of situations that go on. I mean, you asked yesterday <clears throat> how many had read Froome's book, and I was. I just didn't respond because I did not read it. Froome is an interesting character. Froome is also the man that introduced the teachings of the Trinity and promoted the teachings of the Trinity within the church rather than espousing the understanding of the Godhead. When I look at this and I see how many things that Froome was responsible to introduce within the Adventist church of the late 1920s and early 30s. And you see what the effects have been on many of Froome's teachings. We see more the path being ignored and a different path being taken. Yeah, so, so Froom was the last person to check, uh, to take the chart out of the, the library there at the LNG White Estates. That's the I question believe, that's asked in the chat. Right, I believe that was the 1843 chart, correct? It was the, 18, it was the 1850 chart. Okay. 
And, and as far as I know, it was the only copy we have of the 1850 chart that has survived. So it was lost for a time behind a, uh, um, a file cabinet. Okay. <clears throat> so Samson has now left his wife. His intended father-in-law has given his wife to the one that was represented as his friend. So, <clears throat> Sam, the covenant that Samson had looked to enter into with this woman has now been destroyed. It's now been set aside. Is that, do we agree on that or do we have a problem with that statement? All right. So, so would we be saying that the message was taken from Samson and given to someone else? I would be looking at it more that uh, Samson has turned his back on that message. Or is there another way of seeing this? Now, in Judges 15, Samson returning to visit his wife is denied admission to her. He setteth fire to the corn of the Philistines with foxes and firebrands. His wife and her father are burned by the Philistines. Samson smiteth them and retireth to the rock of Etam. The Philistines come up against him. The men of Judah, with his consent, deliver him bound to the Philistines. He killeth a thousand of the Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. God openeth a fountain in Lehi to relieve his thirst. So in Judges 15.1, But it came to pass within a while after, in the time of wheat harvest, that Samson visited his wife with a kid, and he said, I will go into my wife into the chamber. But her father would not suffer him to go in. The feast is completed. He is looking to go into his wife to consummate the marriage. Samson, after turning his back on the covenant, now wishes to complete the covenant. But her father stands in his way. What symbols do we see here? Well, we have the wheat harvest. Okay. Um, and um, I don't know what the symbol here with the father not allowing him entrance, but I, I think of the, the wedding garment feast that where people are turned away because they don't have the wedding garment. Um, That's, that's all I can see at the moment. 
Well, in this situation, the wife is apparently yet under her father's roof, right? So she is still a member of her father's house. She is not seeing it that she is joined to Samson at all. Now she would then have been um, given to this other, to the best man, but he hasn't actually married her yet. That is, he hasn't, because uh, she's still with her father. Okay. Which is, which is interesting. Would that be him going back to a false message? Is she being a church? Being a false message? And he going back to it? That's possible. Now, in this situation, Samson is also bringing a kid. Why? Why would he bring a kid <clears throat> either to his wife or to the wife's father? Is this not some kind of an offering? Would it be a peace offering? And if it's a peace offering, what kind of a message is that? I don't know that I would see it just as dinner. There has to be something more here. Well, especially if, symbolically. <clears throat> exactly. Well, I would think it would be returning to, uh, you know, the, the false system of worship. Could we look at this in the, in the aspect of the 1919 Bible school and 1957 of the uh, publishing of the abomination known as questions on doctrine because Prescott in 1919 wanted to abandon anything having to do with the 2300 days he hoped to never again have to give a sermon on that subject and by 1957, the church, through this publication, chose to turn its back on not only the 2520, but on the 2300 days as a whole. I mean, it, it officially went through this by the time you get down to Ford's time. And when you get to, to Cottrell's publishing in, uh, or in 2002, he goes out very openly to state that the church administrators were in full agreement with Ford. They just didn't want to say this because they didn't want to upset the membership. So Samson goes back in the time of the wheat harvest. He goes to visit his wife. He brings a kid. 
He looks to consummate the marriage. He looks to be unified with his wife. But her father would not suffer him to go in. And her father said, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. So, why is her father, after Samson having gone through the seven-day wedding feast, now offering the younger sister in the, in, in the place of a wife? Uh, I think he was trying to placate Samson. I mean, he knew that Samson was a fearful person having just burned up the cornfields. No. So he didn't want to have a problem. He burns the cornfields after this. Oh, okay. He knows that Samson is a guy that keeps his word because Samson goes down on this journey of, of you said, 30... 33 kilometers? Uh, 33.9 kilometers, so 34 kilometers. Okay, we got 33.9. So you would have 67.8 as a round trip. How much is that in miles? Kilometers in miles. That's about 20 miles. 20 miles. Well, uh, 25 miles. Okay. Could he walk that in a day? 20 miles? Oh, yeah. Easily. So if you're dealing with 25 miles, are you dealing with something where we would have um, scratch that thought? No. Okay. Um, so he takes this trip of 25 miles and 25 miles back because he's going to give these raiments to the ones that espoused his riddle. The father knows that Samson keeps his word. Now her father has said, I thought that thou hast utterly hated her. So he's made the decision. He's made the decision to say, I'm going to give your wife away. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. Why is the father offering the younger sister? What's going on here? Well, symbolically, um, what would this younger sister, I mean, it, it, and it's, um, um, I mean, it does remind us of the story of Re Rachel and Leah. Could it have something to do with a symbol relating to um, time prophecy? Well, Raquel is the one that Jacob loved. He sought to be married to her. Through uh, 
how do you say it? Um, the disingenuousness of Laban, he winds up married to Leah. Okay, the question is asked, is the father trying to avoid what happened to the 30 in Ascalon? What kind of a message does the younger sister represent? Well, it's an alternative message. But it's in the same vein as the older sister. Right. So it's no better. Right. So we have these messages. We haven't really been able to address what the message is. But we know that these are not good messages. They are false messages. I would think that after, you know, these predictions fail, Colin's prediction fails, that there will be some turning back because of the, the proclivity they already have in their ideas of study, they will go to, back to um, a message of false, of a false message further. So they're gonna go back further in that direction. Some, I mean, it, representing the movement, but uh, definitely the negative aspects of it. Okay. This is also happening just before the harvest. At the time of the wheat harvest, yes. So if we establish the time of the wheat harvest, that would have been in the spring of the year, correct? Well, so the time of the wheat harvest would be, it's the later part, because you have the barley harvest first. Right. And then, and then you have the wheat harvest. So it, it's, you know, it's probably like in the second month or um, of the year instead of the first month. Questions being asked, do the two sisters represent two divisions of false messages within the movement? That would be something that's possible. But we'd have to determine what the, the false messages were or consider what they could be. And Samson said concerning them, now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. Uh, can I ask what did what do you mean by he um, though I do him do them a displeasure? What does that actually mean? Is it well? 
did, where they dis where he discomforted him before, like with the um, thirty garments. No, yeah. I think that this is is giving more reference to what he's about to do. The way that this is is being, he's not saying I have done them a displeasure. It's more of an active way that that this is being presented that he has not done them this displeasure but he's about to so and Samson, yeah the, the phrase would you could say when i do them a mischief right so the next verse reads and samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put a firebrand or a torch in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burnt up both the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. So, their corn, their grapes, and their olives, their harvest for the year are being destroyed. Yeah, and we would have, of course, the corn or the grain representing uh, the word of God, the vineyards, the wine representing doctrine, and olives representing uh, the spirit. Right, as, as normal symbols, if we're going to use them as biblical symbols. So this is uh, a destruction of false worship. Now, we also have, of course, 300 foxes. Right. So we know the symbol there, uh, Gideon's 300. And so this would represent some type of victory. Samson. It's, it's like the it's like the torches with or the lamps within within the clay pots. Yeah, it's the same story. Yeah, I was uh, looking. I was looking at Ezekiel recently. Well, it mentions foxes. And the application there is it's uh, understood to be applied to an application for false prophets. Yeah. Right. So these are false prophets. Right. So, but we understand the symbol of the three hundred, and and remember that this is is um, an ironic uh, story. It's if we're going to compare it with the story of Gideon, that's not. That's a positive, direct positive story. Is that what you're saying there, Stephen? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just sort of focusing on the, the foxes. Yeah. I'm not really saying anything about Gideon. But, but we know that we've applied the 300 Gideon to this movement, right? Yes. And now we have foxes, which represent false prophets. And we have the firebrands, we have the torches. We also have a chiasm, right? They turn tail to tail, and he puts yes, a fiber that, in the midst of the two tails. Yeah, and you have at the first in Isaiah talks about the false prophet is the tail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the prophet that tell us lies, he is the tail. So we have two symbols here for a false prophet. And they're, and they're put into pairs and there's a firebrand in the midst. So that represents a chiasm. All right. And Christ compared Herod to a fox too. Mm -hmm. And, and he says it in the context, too, of um, 
today, tomorrow, and the third day. Right? If I'm correct on that one. So you said the tails mean a lie? Yes, so it's a false message. So there's two tails? Two lies? Mm hmm Yeah, when it says, go ye and tell that fox, referring to Herod, behold, I cast out devils and do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perisheth out of Jerusalem, or prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Okay. Then the Philistines said, who hath done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companions. So this was fairly well known in Philistia, that this had occurred, that the wife had been given to another. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. So the threat that was given to this woman of Timnah, that if you don't reveal the meaning of the riddle, we're going to burn you and your father's house was still fulfilled. Yeah, so she could not avoid the consequences. Right. So the Philistines chose to burn her and her father with fire. What does that represent? What, what symbol do, can we see here? Is Samson saying, your message is false. You're destroying your own message. What, what else are we seeing? What else is there here? Well, I still take this as, as applying to the movement in the present time with this test. Okay. It's a riddle. So we have this riddle and we're going to then see the results of this. And now, again, because it's ironic, we, d we don't necessarily take this, um, um, you know, directly. We have to sort of turn it on its head. Okay. Right. So we know that there is, is are different messages that are being given. There's basically a choice that's being given to this movement. Are we going to are we going to continue on the foundation that was laid or are we going to um, depart from that foundation even though it's quite subtle in some ways it's not as direct and exactly what the two sisters represent I mean, I don't know if we know that yet, because this is something that's still to happen. Why is the father born too? Well, the father was going to be burned because it's his house, and that's where his daughter is, is at, is in his house. 
And these are these are messages. Remember, these aren't representing people as such. So if fire is used to denote destruction or of the word of God, does this mean that the word of God now is being presented to the Philistines? And the Philistines would represent I would have to ask if the Philistines aren't representing uh, the Protestant world. Yeah, so that would be the Protestant teaching and understanding, right? So that's what we had understood. So we know that there's going to be a message given to the Protestants at some point. Though primarily we need to first have a message given to Adventists. Right. But Philistines, I mean, the Adventists... The, the Jews are under the oppression of the Philistines at this period of time. Okay. And we know between midnight and the midnight cry, we're going to have the joining of the two sticks, which is going to be the Protestants and Adventists joining. Okay. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. And he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock Etam. Now, if he smites them hip and thigh, Is this not a destruction of their economy? Because then they would not be able to walk. <clears throat> How else could we see this? What kind of a message does this give us? Well, it, he's going to kill them. So smiting them hip and thigh. I'm not really sure what this expression means. I mean, this would be, uh, you know, their legs. Well, here again, we have 158 as the verse. Yeah. 158 on the 1843 chart was the year in which the Jews sought their league with Rome. Here is Samson. He sought a league with the Philistines, which he was not supposed to do. Now he's turning on that league because they have destroyed the wife that he wanted and her father. Now, we don't know because it does not say in scripture, but it's also possible that they also destroyed her younger sister. But he is, as they say, the, he smote them, he kills these people with a great slaughter. Now he goes down and he dwells in the top of the rocky tomb. Then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why are ye come up against us? And they answered, to bind Samson are we come up to do to him as he hath done to us. Comment is being made that this about the, the hip and the thigh is being compared with Jacob being touched by Christ. And that this 
with the Philistines is a false representation of what Jacob went through in the struggle with, with Christ. And then as we're looking at this, let's remember this all did start with a riddle, as is pointed out in the chat. Now, at his marriage feast, Samson was brought into familiar association with those who despise the God of Israel. Whoever voluntarily enters into such relations will feel it necessary to conform to some degree to the habits and customs of his companions. The time was thus spent with vain and trifling persons is worse than wasted. Thoughts are entertained, words spoken, that weaken the citadel of the soul. A few years ago, I found it very interesting in a conversation with a friend. They were telling me how one of the conference leaders of their conference had attended a wedding because it was a wedding of his daughter. And his daughter had chosen to marry a member of the Mormon church. I am aware of those within the church that have chosen to marry Catholics, that have chosen to marry of others of Protestant understanding. These are not easy situations because what Mrs. White is describing here is very, very factual. The wife to obtain Samson, no, excuse me, the wife to obtain whom Samson had, ten, had transgressed the command of God pr proved treacherous to her husband ere the close of the marriage feast. And at last was put to death by the very class whose threats had caused her perfidy. Now, how would we, how would we look at this? Because this is not a word that's in current English use. Well, we you could say her treason. It's just, it's just a warning against all traitors. I mean, we only have, have to look at Judas and look at Samson's wife. Yeah. Doesn't encourage people to become traitors. Yeah, so uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary says, the act of violating faith a promise, vow, or allegiance, treachery, the violation of a trust reposed. Perfidity is not applied to violations of contracts and ordinary pecuniary transactions, but to violations of faith or trust in friendship, in agency and office, in allegiance, in connubial engagements, and in the transactions of kings. So this was a violation of the covenant. The, the violation of her marriage vows. Right? Of, of a friendship. He had, he had um, she was in a relationship of trust with, with Samson and she broke that trust. So that's... Right how perfidity would, uh, so it's. Samson had already given evidence of, the, of his prestigious strength by slaying single-handed a young lion and by killing 30 of the men of Ascalon. Now moved to anger at the barbarous murder of his wife, he attacked the Philistines and smote them with great slaughter. Then wishing a safe retreat from the Philistines and fearing to trust his own countrymen, he withdrew to a strong rock called Etam in the, in the tribe of Judah. 
Samson knew he was going to find no place of safety within the Philistines' territory. He had to withdraw to a desolate area within Judah because he feared his own countrymen. The message that he gave was such that the Philistines didn't want it. And those of Judah didn't trust it. How like the movement today do we see this? After the, the message of July 18th. Is the movement being trusted by the world? Is the movement being welcomed by the church? How do you see it? Stephen, do you have a comment? No, sorry, I must have just uh, lost my pocket. Okay, okay, no problem. Um, so one of the things we see here, we we now have Judah being addressed, and that would refer to um, obviously the Adventist Church, right? And so the message of Samson, this message of July 18th, this movement is going to flee to a place in Judah, to the rock of Etem. Now, Etem is a, it says a hot ground, but it's, it's basically a, an area for wild beasts. So I'm not sure how that would apply here, what, what, what the symbol would be. But, um, and, the, and the Philistines, they went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Le Lehi, which is um, uh, a, um, what's the word here that it was? Uh, a jaw, the word is a jaw, that's what it means. Um, and his place is noted being for the location of Samson's killing of 1,000 men with the jawbone of an ass. So I guess the place could have been um, named because of Samson. Um, <laughs> So, so the symbols here, I mean, we're going to come, have to come back and look at this because this whole story still, I haven't put it all together. Um, but he's going to be bound. Um, 3,000 men are going to come and, and try to bind him. And... Of course, we know that uh, he's going to kill then a thousand men. Or wait, what happens here? He made it. Well, yeah. Okay, we at this point as we're we going to have to go through this. Yeah. Okay, so as we come to the close of our time here today, we're within a couple of minutes of the close of our time. Are there any other thoughts before we go further into? Judges 15, 11. Any other comments? I had a, made the suggestion that, that there was 4,030 people killed by Samson in his lifetime, but we do, we do see there an extra, on, on an, it doesn't specify how many, but those who had burned his father, 
his father-in-law and his wife. So there's just an, an official aspect there to that number. Yeah, it, does, it doesn't give us the number there, but the numbers that it gives us is uh, 4,030, right? Yes. But it, yeah, it doesn't give us that other number. Okay. Anything else? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come to the close of our time together today, we praise you for the different symbols that we are seeing, for the example that we are, are noting in this with Samson. We need your guidance. We need your direction. We need your blessing as we go through this day. Help us to consider these items so that we may more clearly understand the symbols that we need to be understanding at this time. Help us so that those with whom we come in contact will see your character and not ours. Help us to grow in your grace. For this we thank you and for this we praise you, now and always, in Jesus' name. Amen.